Today, a spotlight on Point Cook and Werribee. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to the latest post covering finance and problem news with a distinctively Australian flavour. Today I'm going to continue my Spotlight series. I've had a large number of requests from viewers to delve into specific postcodes and provide some information about what's going on. So I've compiled quite a long list and I'm going for those with the largest numbers of votes. And right at the top, was Werribee and Point Cook. So that's where we're going to look today. And by the way, if you want a private conversation, a one-on-one -on -one session on any postcode across Australia, my one-on-one -on -one sessions are still available and you just need to contact me via my DFA blog for more details. Now, it's worth saying, as I always do with these sorts of particular discussions, that this is not financial advice. Uh, this is merely me reporting what I'm seeing based on my modelling, and on my surveys. But it is a reasonably rounded view as to what's going on. And certainly you can then compare and contrast different locations and particularly compare different states. Of course, the modelling draws on our surveys, the 52,000 household surveys, which are running all the time. And we incorporate information from all sorts of other sources as well, including JobKeeper and JobSeeker, as well as other publicly available information. And this information is up to date from last Tuesday. And that allows us then to form a view based on mortgage stress, the price trajectory and history, the buying and selling intentions from our surveys, the migration data, the economic data like the CPI wages and employment data. All of that goes into our core market model. In the core market model, we have multiple scenarios because, of course, there are many variables to think and consider at the moment. And that allows us to look at it as a state or a region, or indeed an all Australia level, but it also allows us to look down at a postcode level. So we're looking at Werribee and Point Cook. That's in Victoria, postcode 3030. And this is the area to the west of Melbourne, down towards Geelong. And it's an area of extremely high development and a lot of new construction over the last few years. This is pretty typical of what you can see. Lots of properties crammed in quite close together. It's a pretty flat plain. Goes down towards the ocean, of course, at one side and up into the hinterland at the other side. And there's been some development and uh, some infrastructure. This is the shopping centre at Point Cook. That's another view of the same area. And they've put in quite a lot of infrastructure in terms of roads and rail and those sorts of things, which puts it as an access route into Melbourne, down to Geelong. So it's actually quite well serviced in terms of infrastructure, but the quantum of development over recent years has been pretty remarkably high. So if we look now at property for sale, and this is all types of property, there are nearly 600 properties currently for sale across postcode 3030. And here are a few examples. There's a lot of land being sold, as you can see in that first one. Quite a lot of construction based on home and land packages. And wherever you look, there is more new development happening. Now, in some cases, the guide prices are quite broad. For example, this house in Werribee, 810 to 880. In others, they're actually quoting more specific prices although sometimes it's not totally clear whether it's a standalone property or whether it's attached in some way. And you have to say that these constructions are relatively formulaic. Now, if I look at sold properties, there are around 112 properties sold in the last eight weeks in 3030. And it's the same old, same old with the last asking price being cited on the portals. Piece of land for around $300,000. The last asking price for land there with a guide price, well, quite a wide range, 356 to 391. Last asking price for a property, more land, more property, and in some cases, again, quite a wide range. It's quite hard to get really good information on what prices are selling for at the moment. I was talking to an agent recently who said that there had been a lot of interest and he didn't have much stock. Well, all I can say is 
statistically speaking, there is a lot of stock on the market. Although, as we will see later, some of that stock has been hanging around for a long, long time. And the range is 690 to 759 or 640 to 670. Really doesn't tell you very much at all. And here's yet more land. So a lot of further development is underway in the area. And of course, that tells you something about the supply and demand disequilibrium or equilibrium and the relative trajectory of prices ahead. So let's look at the current price trends. And I'm going to look first at wearable units. So back in 2013, the average unit price was $250,000. Today, it's $380,000. But the trajectory is quite interesting. There were significant rises in 2015, 2017, 2018. Small rises in 2016 but falls in 2019 and nothing at all happening this year so far. And that gives you an average gain of 5.9% between 2013 and 2020, or after inflation, 3.9%. If I look at units in Werribee South, which is closer to the water, well, then units were around 461. Now they're 465. So there has been really very little growth. And in fact, you can see that the significant rises were in 2014. There were significant falls in 2016 and 2018. A bit of a rise in 2019 and nothing much at all happening in 2020. And that translates into an average gain between 2013 and 2020, 1.6% 1 per annum, or after inflation, negative 0.4%. If we look at houses in Werribee, Back in 2013, the average home price for a house was $300,000. Now it's $510,000. And the most significant rises were in 2016, up 17.2%. In 2017, up 24%. Small rise in 2018, nothing in 2019, and a very small rise of 1% in 2020. And that gives an average gain between 2013 and 2020 of 7.5% per annum or 5.5% after inflation. If you look at Werribee South houses, rather similar sort of story, but not quite so much growth. 538,000 in 2013, up to 620,000 in 2020. But considerable falls in 2016, rises in 2017 and a fall in 2020. That gives an average gain of 3.9% over the last seven years, or after inflation, 1.8% per annum. If we go to Point Cook itself, houses there back in 2013 were around 445,000 median. Today, $650,000 median. And most significant price rises were in 2017, up 22%. Some rises in 2016, but falls then in 2014. 2019 almost nothing and a small rise in 2020 to give an average gain over the last seven years of 5.5 percent or 3.4 percent after inflation if you look at units they haven't performed quite as well three hundred twenty six thousand dollars in 2013 now four hundred and fifty eight thousand dollars in 2020 there was a small fall this year similar fall last year and in fact 2017 was the year of significant rises Overall, the average gain is 4.9% per annum or 2.9% after inflation. If I go to Derrimont, houses there, 417,000 in 2013. Now in 2020, $638,000. And significant rises in 2016 and 2017. Not a lot else really. And a fall this year down 1.7% so far. That gives an average gain of 6.1% over the seven years or 4.1% per annum inflation adjusted. Now let's summarize the postcode. There are around 1,900 listings at the moment with 560 added in the past month, but 610 properties have been listed for more than six months. And looking at those long-term listings, it's a mix of overpriced older properties and overpriced recently built properties that have come back on the market relatively quickly. Interestingly, of course, if you are looking to buy new and there's a bit of attraction for homeland packages at the moment with the government stimulus it means that people perhaps veer towards buying new off the plan rather than existing new 
and that is putting downward pressure on the vast supply of existing built property that now is for sale. In May 2019, listings were slightly lower at 1,780. And overall, 93% of properties are houses, the rest are units. In terms of gross yield, it's around 3.5% for houses, a slight fall from last year. The net yield is around 1.75% and the yields are falling. Gross yields for units are around 4.5%. That's a fall from 3.9% from last year. The net yield is around 3.25% and it's falling. And the rents for houses are flat with a typical rent of around $385,000 per week for houses, whereas rents for units, which are also flat, are around $330 per week for units. Now, vacancy rates are around 3.2% at the moment, which is roughly the same as mid-May 2019. There are around 450 vacancies at the moment, and that compares with 380 last year. And the asking price on average for houses is falling. It's down about 1.7% over the quarter, with a typical house price now of $560,000. The average settlement price is about 6% lower than asking. Units there, the asking price is on average flat with a typical unit asking price of around $385,000, and the average settlement is around 5% lower than asking, and the intention to sell is rising. Now, turning to my stress data, there are around 36,000 households in the area. That's a very high count for a particular postcode, of which around 19,600 are borrowing, 14,700 are renting, and there are around 11,000 properties for rent. The number of rental property owners, in other words, property investors, are around 9,700. And the overall financial stress measure in the postcode is 39%. Now, looking at that in more detail, around 5,960 households who are borrowing are in mild mortgage stress. That equates to about 30%. And the risk of default is around 2%. Rental stress is at 44%, which is around 6,400 households. And 19% of property investors are experiencing stress at the moment. That's around 1,500. So to sum up this postcode, there is some financial stress here, but it is not as severe as some other places. And the reason for that mainly is that prices are still relatively low compared with other areas in and around Melbourne. So now let's look at the price scenarios. And as normal, I present here my best case, which assumes that the virus is under control very quickly. The longer term crunch is my middle scenario, which assumes that we do get some control of the virus, but the international borders remain shut for some long time. And as a result, the economy continues to languish for two or three years with unemployment remaining very high. And my worst case scenario is called multi-wave, and that's when we might see the virus re-emerge here as it has in Europe. And in that situation, there would be a much more negative impact on prices. And these are cumulative price movements for units in Werribee between 2021 and 2023. Now, let's look at Werribee unit prices. This year, around 380,000 on average. A full next year down to 314,000, that's down 17.4%. Only a very small fall the following year, and then a small rise in 2023. That would take prices to around 320000 which would put them back where they were in 2016-2017. Now, if I look at my scenarios for houses in Werribee, generally houses perform better than units, and there is no exception here. So currently, the average house price in Werribee is $510,000, that's likely to fall by about 7.9% over the next year to $470,000. A further small fall to $460,000 in 2022. That's down 2.2%. And then a small rise in 2023, which will put it at $467,000, which will be where it was in 2017. Now, applying the scenario for units in Werribee South, rather similar story with considerable falls if in fact the multi-wave virus scenario plays out. Taking my mid case, which is the one that I use for my scenarios, the price currently is $465,000 for a unit. We think that could fall around 17% to $384,000 next year. And then a small rise the following year, and then a small fall to $388,000. 
which will take prices lower than they've been for the last few years. The scenario for houses is not so severe, and there the average home price for a house is $620,000, could fall by around 7 to 8% to say $571,000 next year, a small fall in 2022 to $559,000, and then a very small fall down 0.9% in 2023 to take prices back to $554,000. Now, $554,000 would be putting prices back to where they were in 2013-14. Now, if I go to Point Cook houses, there the scenario is, again, not too severe in the art longer term crunch scenario, but translating it to prices, $650,000 now, dropping by 9.3% next year, then a fall of 1.1%, and then a small rise of 1%, taking prices to $589,000, which will put prices back to where they were in or around 2016-17. Units in the same postcode may well fall further, and in that scenario, prices will drop from their current level of $458,000, down 15% to $387,000 next year, then a small fall in 2022, and a small rise in 2023 to take prices to around $386,000, which would put prices back to where they were in 2016. And finally, if we look at Derrimont, we can see that houses in that particular area are again looking as though they will probably fall over the next three years. The question is by how much? And in my mid-case scenario, $638,000 currently, falling 9.5% next year to $577,000. A further fall of 2.4% in 2022, down to $563,000, and then a rise in 2023, up 2.6% to $578,000. And $578,000 would take us back to where we were back in 2016-17. And so you can see from my modelling that the chances of capital appreciation in this particular area are quite low. There are a few reasons for that. The first reason is that we see a number of people buying new home and land packages, so the supply of new property is going to continue to flow. Um, of course, the current government stimulus is encouraging that. That's putting pressure on existing properties. The second factor is that the stress in the area is quite significant and there will be a number of households with mortgage stress that will be forced to sell over the next few weeks and months. Property investors in the area are not doing too badly at the moment, but some renters are still under pressure. And my expectation is that with JobKeeper and JobSeeker coming to an end over the next few months, more of those households will have to move into cheaper accommodation, so that will put more pressure on the supply-demand equilibrium. But prices here are still relatively benign relative to other parts of Melbourne. So to an extent, it is still a bit of a magnet for those looking to buy cheap and with some access to Melbourne. But I would caution that if you buy now, the chances are prices will be lower over the next two or three years rather than the higher. And so if you're buying a property with a very limited equity stake, say 5%, the chances are you will lose that equity over the next few years. And my longer term modelling suggests that prices might well take five to eight years to recover with a peak up to where they were back in 2017, probably by 2027. So very little capital growth at the moment and very little capital growth expected. And that means that more property investors will probably walk away. And that puts all the asset on first-time buyers, who are indeed very firm players in this part of the market, as well as those trading up. But the general low quality of construction, the continued high supply, and the continued financial pressures and higher end levels of unemployment suggest to me that prices will stay on the downside for some time yet. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching, and I'll see you again next time.